This week on Writers Inc. You know, in our band, the lead guitarist for a long time was the bass player. He, he's like a lead bass player, like the Who, right? So I've always been like the rhythm guy, and I'm so I've always I wouldn't say I stay home with the drummer, but kind of. So I've always been like dun 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 dun, and when I sit down to write a novel, it's that same thing, and it's a sense of what is the beat of this novel, and some of these stranger novels. Um, you know, because I've written 37 now. And some of the weirder ones, you know, I'll come after reading the, like, maybe the rough draft was written as like a jazz beat. Because when I come back to the rough draft, I'm like, what, what the hell is the rhythm here? <laughs> you know? But it made sense while I was writing it. So to me, that's the biggest assist is the rhythm of the music and get to the writing of the books. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories, all have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the best seller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out, school's in session. This is Writer's Inc. Hi, it's Christine Daigle. Patrick O'Donnell. J.P. Radbush. Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writer's Inc. So anybody have anything exciting happen in the past seven days that we haven't covered? Not unless you want me to talk about my fireplace <laughs> yeah. table again. I'm, I'm still excited <laughs> about it, but... <laughs> This is the life of a writer, right? Like it just literally like seven days goes by, nothing worthwhile nothing has happens. Happened. Yeah. <laughs> We're all yeah. sitting in the same places doing the exact same thing. Except for Kevin. Who, make who, me feel inadequate. Yeah, I'm in a hotel you, room. Yeah. So yeah. Get, I had a little family you, emergency I had to come you, down. You get kicked out again? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> oh. That's the family emergency. <laughs> That's the family emergency. <laughs> That's air quotes family emergency. Yes. The money runs out tomorrow, so you'll find me sleeping on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there's worse places to sleep, you're right? Yeah. What you do is you park your car on a bridge and leave the door open and just write, I'm sorry, on the windshield. <laughs> Just, just, oh, whoa! Yeah. Oh, uh, dark turn, like, man. Dude. Yeah, it, it, it takes seven years for the family to be able to collect, but at least you know you, the kids will be okay. Will be okay. I, you know what? I'm just going to do that happening? on other people's cars. I'm just going to find any random car parked anywhere. No, right. I'm don't sorry. do that. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? Yeah, when I was working, if we had two major bridges in the city that you know people would jump off of, and you would get the call for the car just parked on the side of the road, you know, at the very crest of the bridge, you know, it's like, all right, call the Coast Guard. We know what happened. Yeah. I've never understood the whole jumping off a bridge thing. It's like, because there's videos of people cliff diving, you know, like jumping a yeah. hundred feet down into the water and they, they come up perfectly okay. But then somebody jumps off a, a bridge in Brooklyn and, and they're they're gone. Like, I, I don't know what the, the difference is. Uh, I'm not willing to get out there and try well, it. Well, on the upside, someone fell <laughs> off of the Ambassador Bridge like a couple of weeks ago that was working 150 feet into the water and they were okay. The Coast Guard pulled them out in five minutes. So there you yeah, go. Yeah. So what oh. is that? Is it is it all about know. how you land? Yes, I thought it was a uh, certain distance too. What happens is, this is what ha I've investigated a bunch of these, and what happens is, the bottom of the river or the lake or whatever is very murky, and it's almost like quicksand. And a lot of people have gotten stuck. They were alive when they hit the bottom, but they couldn't swim back up. It would they actually get stuck there and right. they just drown a horrible, painful death. So there's your cheery. Uh, you. Yeah, that's that, that, that's how, that sounds terrible. Yeah. Keep listening to us for more realistic <laughs> yeah. tips for your thriller. Okay. Uh, <laughs> or yeah. a, a good, uh, JP, another good. What's in the what's in the news? <laughs> JP, Come on. I'm, no, I'm, I'm cutting you off. Going going to news. News. Come on, I got. Some I don't want to hear anymore. News. I've got some good ones. The cozy no, I, writer is done with this. <laughs> yeah. <that's, laughs> Oh, I, I all right, Pat, Patrick over there dusting off the Patrick files. I don't want yeah, any part well, of that. Well, you know, um, <laughs> it's time for the news. Um, yeah, okay, yeah. so we're gonna jump over <laughs> and uh, we're gonna talk AI because why not? Oh. First up in the news, 
Amazon won't remove books listed under a real author's name, but allegedly allegedly written with AI. Uh, so this is journalist, author, and professor Jane Friedman uh, discovered that Amazon was selling books falsely attributed to her name, reportedly generated using AI. Titles like Your Guide to Writing a Bestseller ebook on Amazon were linked to her profile alongside with uh, her legitimate works. Um, so since this uh, letter the books have been pulled but they're still kind of like there they're just like unavailable um but more than likely you're gonna see more of this as uh people start using ai and start publishing it under false pretenses <laughs> there yeah. there's so much scary horrible in this this one little story like yeah. i don't even know where to, to start um i mean this kind of thing is already happening like if, if you go to just type in stephen king on amazon there's another guy out there named stephen r king yeah um don't know if that's mm -hmm. his real name or not his real name but the, the books are horrible um you know average like two stars um but he sold a lot of them because people are you know they they will hit that click you know they click on that button not realizing that they're buying from somebody else um so that brings up an, another question have you guys ever trademarked your name or researched that at all no, no. i researched it after i read this article so i'm curious <laughs> okay. to hear what you have to say about that <laughs> yeah so my, my name is trademarked but it's it's the visual like the image of my name like right. it has to be written a, a specific way right. you can't um, yeah yeah, so I don't know that that would even protect in a, in a situation like this. I mean, you, I don't know that there really is a way to, to do that other than like technically this this AI person or whoever it is. I mean, and it doesn't have to be AI. Anybody could do this. Those mm -hmm. books could stay up there. Um, they just can't be linked to the other person, you know, the other author's account right. as if they're they're tied together. Um, yeah. there's, there's nothing keeping them from doing that. Yeah, that that's what makes this very tricky is you, you can't trademark a name. Uh, you can. You can. I I researched it, yeah, oh, but it has okay. to be a unique name, and it has to be for business purposes. Yeah. Um, mm. So Bruce Springsteen and Taylor Swift both have their name trademarked. Michael mm. Jordan could not because his name was too common. Yeah. So he trademarked Michael Jordan 23, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> um, so if your name is unique, you can trademark it if you have a Unless your name for is it. literally unique because I think that one's too common <laughs> Yeah, but it's so. and then you have to do it in certain areas. So, like, if you trademark it in books, it doesn't mean it's trademarked in like cars or whatever. You know that's what I that, mean? So, that's yeah. the truth. Yeah, that, that yeah, that is kind of the caveat. Is uh, is same with businesses. Like, you know, that's if you if you look at the story of Apple Computer and Apple, uh, the Apple record label. Uh, you know, the whole thing with they owned the rights to the Beatles music, for example, and there was a whole fall out there years and years ago uh when apple started to kind of get into the music business because they had signed agreements saying you know as long as they were just a computer company you know there was no car there was no infringement on the trademark of apple the music label but once they started doing you know once they made the ipod basically or made itunes i think uh then suddenly there was question and for a long time you couldn't buy beatles music on apple because of that that whole lawsuit hmm. Times have changed. Yeah. Now, Christine, how much <laughs> how much is a trademark? I've never even looked into it. How much does it cost? I don't know. That's something I don't know how much it costs to trademark your name. Because no copyrights aren't terribly expensive. No. I, I know yeah. they're different. I, I, yeah. I did it through a regular attorney. Um, okay. I, I, I did it through an attorney. It was just a little little under 1500 bucks from start to finish. It wasn't crazy <laughs> expensive. Um, I'm sure you could go out there on like LegalZoom and do it for you know less, less than 100. Um, but it just I, I felt like it was just one of those things. I wanted to make sure you know like an actual person who knew what they were doing was, was actually doing it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes. Yeah. Next up in the news is a cross-section of AI and data analytics. Uh, so fiction analytics site ProseCraft uh, has shut down after author backlash. So this website, ProseCraft.io, was a site that used the full text of over 25,000 copyrighted books, developing a data-driven insight into writing styles, and it was shut down after protests from authors. Uh, so this sort of data was used to analyze word count, passive voice, vividness, and other markers. Um, but ultimately, it was shut down because of the fact that you're basically using 25,000 copyrighted books. I find this interesting because I'm someone that comes from the realm of data and analytics. And I'm like, this is cool, but where's the line? 
And I think that this one was one that crossed the line at least a little too early. Yeah, I remember hearing about these guys a while back um, only because I, I work with Patterson and, and they had analyzed a bunch of James Patterson books to figure out how much of them he actually wrote versus the co-authors. Um, and the numbers are actually surprising you know, because he, he does write quite a bit of the, the book and most people don't realize that. Um, I, I, and Autocrit, which is one of our sponsors, I actually reached out to them because they do something similar. In Autocrit, you can compare your own work to, you know, there's mm -hmm. about 100 famous authors in there, um, me being one of them. Um, and I actually sent them an email asking the question, you know, how did you create this? Like, you know, what data did you use to, to you know, generate this system? Um, I haven't heard back from them. <laughs> so this is probably the second or third story like this that I've seen pop up. I imagine internally they're probably looking at that, trying to decide if it's something they want to continue or not continue. Uh, but I do feel anything like this at this point, if you're stepping on the toes of any author using any form of AI, um, you have to be very, very careful of it because it is extremely litigious at this point and it's only going to get worse before it gets better. Um, it, uh, there's there's obvious lines here, you know, like if, if you go on Amazon, you can get 15% of pretty much any book. Like, are, are you able to use that to train? Not able to use that to train? Those are the kind of things that are going to have to get figured out. I think they have an opportunity, though, because um, if you could – so to turn this around, like I would immediately start approaching publishers and authors for permission to use their work to train these things because mm -hmm. there's an advantage to the author, I think – in having their work included in this, if it's not being used to reproduce their work, you know, uh, right. there's some brand recognition and, and things like that that can happen. So, and it's, you know, ultimately it's a, it's a useful tool and I want to see useful tools exist. Right. I just don't want to see people cheated in order for them to exist. Yeah, yeah just to backpedal a little bit on that. Like I, I use Autocrit all the time um, and I've got a bunch of co-authors right now writing books with me. Um, I love the fact that they can drop the book that we're co-authoring together into Autocrit and it's going to tell them where they differ from me um, because it's saving mm -hmm. me the trouble of having to go out there and do that. Um, but that's such a unique one-off situation. I, I don't know if that's you know something that makes it a worthwhile feature for everybody else. But if it's being used you know, just for craft, for craft's sake... You know, nothing nefarious, etc. And, you know, it's the same thing with Hemingway, Grammarly. It's all AI, you know, powered. But I guess, you know, the difference is, you know, you're specifically taking from different authors. But who's to say these other AI platforms are not doing that? And they're, you know, helping authors out, you know, just like you're talking about with like Autocrit. You know, it's what's the difference between that and going to the library and doing the footwork and grabbing, you know, five authors that you like out off the bookshelves yeah. and analyzing their books. Obviously, it's going to take a whole lot longer, but you could do it. This is just like you hit one button and then boom, it's done. Right. It's like anything. I was talking, my sister came to visit for the past week and she runs a hospital down in Florida. We were talking about a new AI system that is, is basically rolling out and available to doctors um, and it can analyze a problem. So you walk into, you know, let, let's say a doctor's office, you tell your doctor, you know, this, this hurts, that hurts, whatever. You explain your symptoms. That doctor uses their, their mental Rolodex to figure out what's actually wrong with you. Um, this new system uses AI to do that. So if you think about it, it's got access to every piece of medical data ever created from the beginning of time to the present and they can diagnose pretty much anything and it made me think of how it's the, that show on fox but you know the, the ai version of it um, where this becomes nefarious though is the insurance companies have access to this system um, so they can go in there and say well this particular treatment is very expensive uh -huh. so we don't want this to appear as a diagnosis and they can start fine-tuning that um, and that's where they already do that get, get, yeah it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's there, happening some yeah, dirty dogs, but, but more from sure, a payment yes. standpoint yeah, th th and that, that's what it's feeding from. I mean, that happens today, but basically what happens is a doctor, you know, diagnoses you, they prescribe X, and X is very, very expensive, and the insurance company says, no, we're not going to pay for it. So that's basically their version of gatekeeping. But in the AI version of the same situation, that gatekeeper is silent. You may not even know that that diagnosis exists. And if doctors start using this, and I have no doubt they will, this is going to become a tool one way or the other. Right. Um, you know, the the doctors themselves, I think, are going to get dumbed down because now they are just looking at reports. It's no different than now. Like if you get blood work done, you know, they look at that report and the computer tells them whether, you know, a level is high or low. Like they've, they've got no insight into it anymore. Anybody can read these reports. Um, you don't need a doctor to go to four, you know, all these years of medical school anymore and, you know, specialize in something. So it's, 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 a, it's across the board. So last in the news, we're, it's not AI, but it's not necessarily Yay. happy. Um, so, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Booksellers <laughs> and uh, industry groups file a suit to block Texas book rating law. So a coalition of booksellers and book industry groups have filed a federal lawsuit against a new Texas law known as the Reader Act, which mandates the creation and implementation of a rating system for books based on sexual content. So ultimately what this law does is it requires book vendors to review and rate books as sexually explicit or sexually relevant um, with the state having the power to review and overrule those. So booksellers who refuse to comply may be barred from selling to Texas schools. So imagine a book vendor having to read every single book that they purchase and give it a rating. Wow. Mm. Well, what's the difference between this and the ratings on movies? There, there, there isn't. I'm going to play devil's advocate here because yeah. um, the rating system I, I am all in favor for. Um, I think where the we have to be careful is, you know, like what is actually done with that rating, the actual gatekeepers. What mm -hmm. are they going to do with with that particular knowledge? Um, to put this in perspective, Florida just passed a law that basically eliminates the, the teaching of, of certain things and like transgender stuff like that is is specifically called out in the, the you know, don't say gay law, I think is what they've been calling it down there. Um, they just banned a, a psychology book that is typically used in, in every university down there um, because it's got a chapter on that, you know, studying it from a psychology standpoint, you know, which is, you know, if you've got psychologists, you know, like they need to understand this. It's a, a mental you know, condition, possibly like there's different ways to look at it, but they basically banned the entire book just simply because it has that in there. Um, using the Texas law, like there might be a label on the book saying that it has that, then the institution can decide whether or not they actually right. want to include it. The library can decide whether or not they want to include it. Um, no different to me, like as Patrick said, in the rating system on a movie, you turn it on, it says it's got smoking, it's got violence, it's got this, it's got that. Um, and then you can make that judgment call. It, it just saves you the trouble of having to read that book. Um, I, I'm all for the rating system. I think they need to perfect the, the gatekeeper side of it. That's that's my exact feeling on this. I, I, I think that having a way to identify what uh, the subject matter is, is a part of empowering and informing you know, consumers and universities and others. But you, weaponizing it, uh, something like that against these publishers and authors, that's uh, something the state should never have the power to do. Um, spoken like a true libertarian, I guess. But I mean, I, I, I'm all in favor of giving people information. I am not in favor of using that information to limit what people have access to. And at the end of the day, if you're very concerned about what your kids or teenager is reading, you're the parent, read it first, get up off your butt and actually put yep. the effort in. And it's like, okay, in my house, this is what we read. This is what we don't read. You know, this is not appropriate for a six year old kid. This is, this is okay for, you know, a 16 year old kid. And whatever your beliefs are, whatever, yeah. that's your family. That's, you know, I, I don't like Big Brother telling me what to do. This episode is brought to you by Autocrit. One of the most value packed memberships for any author, Autocrit brings you an amazing suite of tools that make it a breeze to plan, write, and edit your books all in one place. Autocrit takes you far above standard grammar checking or cookie cutter guidance. Instead, it's like having an experienced editor in your genre watching over your shoulder to help you deliver great writing that keeps your audience trapped in the story. You can even compare your writing style to more than 100 best-selling authors right down to the word level, so you can see what the best in the business do to keep their storytelling clean, clear, and crisp. Listeners of the Writers Inc. podcast can now take advantage of lifetime membership for one single fee. That's right, no renewal fees. Hi, this is JD Barker. I've used Autocrit for years, and not only has it improved my writing, but it's been a crucial tool with aspiring authors that I've mentored. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just beginning, it'll help you find your weak spots and weed them out. Give it a shot with your latest project. Trust me, your editor will thank you. Head to autocrit.com slash JD to get your lifetime membership. Big thanks to Autocrit for sponsoring the show. All right. Cool. JD, who's up this week? This week, we've got Josh Mallerman back for time number four. He's the New York Times bestselling author of Bird Box and many other titles at this point. He's going to be or he's here to tell us about his latest uh, short story collection called Spin a Black Yarn, which releases August 15th. Here he is, Josh Mallerman. Josh Mallerman, welcome back to the show. Hello, and I am glad. I think, as we were saying beforehand, I think this is maybe the fourth time. Yeah, I think this is number four. But I want to start the interview with, I was reading your very good book, Spin a Black Yarn, which is you know a series of novellas. And I think my favorite um, 
story is Doug and Judy buy a house washer. I, I absolutely love that one. And there's one part in the story where there's a Fabergé egg like swishing around this house. And my mind went instantly to risky business. Is that where you got it from or how did you come up with that? You know, for listeners, um, the house washer is this newfangled um, tech device that this jerk, just a jerk of a couple by you stand in this tube while the solution fills your house and washes everything in your house for you. And, 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 and the piano from the piano to the couch cushions to if you have a Fabergé egg to this, and <laughs> you have to be very rich, obviously, to afford one of these. And as you can imagine, um, dear listeners, um, watching your entire life like swirl around you while you're in this tube might might drive you a little bit crazy. The egg was just, you know, it, it just seemed like if anybody was going to have one of those, it was Doug and Judy Barman. Those two are. And, and again, those two would have it for the wrong reason. <laughs> Now, I got to ask you, where did you come up with that idea of the house washer? I think it's even trademarked on on there. Yeah, yeah. That's just sort of me being like cheeky, I think. But yeah, yeah. Allison Allison and I had just moved into a house. Um, It was like the first. Yeah, it was like the first kind of house I'd ever really like moved in on my own. And Allison and I were somewhat new then, you know, and. Um, I, when we were standing in, and it was like, you know, four bedrooms and there was a big living room and, and I was standing, I think in the kitchen area. And I said to her, can you imagine if we were like in a tube right now and the, and everything we owned, you know, was swirling around us being cleaned. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, and then we will, cause you know, it seemed like a big place to clean. And then I started thinking, and it's almost, the, it's almost the natural next thought that imagine someone in the tube watching like all like the bad deeds they've done swirling around by way of possessions, right? Like you right. got the on this place because you screwed someone over. You made the money for this because you screwed someone over. So so to have Doug and Judy surrounded by, it's almost like their guilty conscience is like <laughs> swirling around them while they're in the tube. Yeah, I really liked it. You know, even like pictures are coming out of the photo album, you know, and just yeah. that kind of stuff. And it's like, man, this is awesome. I don't want to ruin it for, you know, the listeners because, you know, go out and buy the book. But yeah, I by far, that was my favorite um, story in there. Wow. So, thank you. That was very cool. So what came first, music or books? Well, it's hard to tell. You know, I think that at some point, as a, a writer, and once you become like a published writer, I think you begin to sort of look for the breadcrumbs that led to this moment. You know, have I always been a writer? Have I, you know, was this something, was there a lightning bolt moment? Um, This kind of thing. And so for me, it goes, hi, Dewey, my cat. Uh, if you guys hear a cat, that's my talkative black cat, Dewey. Your buddy, say hi. Okay, Dewey. Well, and, I'm shocked that you have a black cat. No way. <laughs> <laughs> With what you write, no way. This is so shocking. <laughs> and I started to find breadcrumbs, like in fifth grade, tried to write a novel. And then that was followed by, you know, sort of like comic books. Then that was followed by, you know, short stories, kind of. Then it was followed by, blah, 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 blah. And somewhere in there, my best friends were starting to play music. And we're all hanging out every single day and I'm trying to write stories and poems and they're writing music and around age, you know, I'd go see them in the talent show and stuff. We were just like artsy friends or something. Yeah. And at some point, you know, when we were like 18, 19, you know, they were like, Hey, what if you, what if you play like the organ or some sort of ding, ding, ding background and help us like write songs or whatever you write, you know? And that's like 19 year old logic, right? Like, right, all, right. Someone's got to play something, right? You got to play something, Josh. So they, they kind of taught me the rudimentary, like chords of the organ and even bought me an organ, this uh, old Farfisa thing. Yeah. And, and they, and started singing the poems I was writing. And another friend uh, also was writing and he was singing poems he wrote shortly after that. Well, then by, at this point, we all got bit by the bug. Like, this is amazing. Shortly after that, I'm like, okay, I want to, now I want to write a novel, right? So, mm. so it begins like 10, a decade of quote unquote failing at writing a novel. And the only thing I ever mean by failing is not finishing one. You can write the worst book in the world, but if you finish that thing, dude, you have all my respect that I have to give. So, but I didn't finish one for like 10 years and around age 29, I did. 
and around age 39 got published. So we're talking about decades of trying to write, finishing stuff, uh, in intertwined with touring and with music. Yeah. So which came first. I mean, I guess writing came first. Mm -hmm. But when things got like kind of like more like serious, it seemed like the band and let's write a novel happened around the same time. Oh, OK, so they kind of fed off of each other there. That's definitely kind of cool. So the band High Strung mm -hmm. yeah, is is that still going today? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah. Yep. Good for you. You know, I was going to ask you the Sophie's Choice question. If you only had to do one with writing books or being in a high strung, which one, which one would it be? Well, it, you know, I guess if the question is writing or music, then it's got to be writing. Cause I'm, I'm like a real building guy. Like I'm a fan of like Motown, how they have like songwriters that, um, you know, I've again, like the utmost respect for the songwriters almost more than I do for Smokey Robinson. Right. And like the real building, Neil Diamond writing songs for the monkeys and this kind of thing. Right. Read, like the songwriter, at, the writer as musician, as artist, excites me more than the guitarist. Mm. And so, and I'll always be like, man, who wrote this one? Who wrote this one? You know, when you first get into the Beatles, who who wrote the majority of this one? You know, that kind of thing. And right. So definitely the writing side of it has always had my heart, whether it's books or songs. So do you think being a good music? songwriter or author or vice versa they just complement each other does it make you a better songwriter does it make you a better author by being those two things so there was a long period of time where every like smaller idea i had rather than becoming a short story became a song and any bigger idea i had became a novel so oh okay so uh, there's a number of high strong albums that um almost uh, play like like anthologies like short stories each song mm. And I had like something like written like 14 novels before I started writing short stories. So, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. It was like a real divide there for me. Yeah. And then at some point, I was like, what am I doing? Like, let's, you know, let's try to write short stories and let's write a concept album either way, right? Either direction. Sure. But I do think that the biggest compliment, I suppose, that music pays the writing is the rhythm of it. And, you know, in our band, the lead guitarist for a long time was the bass player. He, he's like a lead bass player, like the who, right? Right. And now we have a lead guitar player. So I've always been like the rhythm guy. And I'm so I've always, I wouldn't say I stay home with the drummer, but kind of. So I've always been like, dun, 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 dun. and when I sit down to write a novel, it's that same. Oh, okay. That same thing. And it's a sense of what is the beat of this novel. And some of these stranger novels, um, you know, because I've written 37 now. And some of the weirder ones, you know, I'll come after reading the, like maybe the rough draft was written as like a jazz beat. Cause when I come back to the rough draft, I'm like, boy, what the hell is the rhythm here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it made sense while I was writing it. So, so that's the, to me, that's the biggest assist is the rhythm of the music sure. to the writing of the books. Interesting. Do you listen, do you physically listen to music while you're writing? Oh yeah. So over there, listeners i'm pointing beyond the camera um is god like 200 vinyl horror movie soundtracks <laughs> okay yeah is like that I, cool? I'll, like like the original the shining and the original oh okay phantasm and the original carry all the soundtracks and behind me as you can see is a record player yes and so when i sit down here to write i grab one of those put it on oh. and just write to like a scary soundtrack Usually what happens is you find one that fits the mood of the book you're writing. Yeah. And then you just listen to that one over and over again for the duration of a uh, mm. rough draft. You no, know, just going back to the music. I, when I listen to your band, I start thinking of jet, the cult fire town before they were garbage. Yeah. You know, and a buddy of mine, I'm just like, listen to this band real quick. I said, who does it remind you? He said the Kings. And I'm like, no shit. And I'm like, the Kings? So I start, the Kings, K I N G S. Who are they? Um, they were an older band, kind of a one hit wonder. They wrote, I knew you were going to ask that, and I have it. Um, this beat goes on. Okay. I'll look that up later, but that's yeah. exciting. Cool. But yeah, check that out. The Kings, the the beat, this beat goes on. I that that's why. And one thing that really, really stood out in my head was the bass. That's funny that you were saying that because yep. I was a, well, I still am a big Who fan, 
And I went and saw them in like 1980. So not or not 80. I saw them in like 89 or something. Yeah. And yeah. I had no idea John Entwistle was playing what he was playing. I thought it was Pete Townsend. And I'm yeah. just like, holy shit, this guy is amazing on the yeah. bass. I've never heard a bass player play like that before. Yeah, or since. I know he really yeah. is one of the most exciting. You know, there's there's a th- there's things on YouTube um, where you can, it, he's isolated. I think it's a live show. Okay. It's just like a camera on him and you're just listening to his part. You know, it's live. Right. And while the other guys must be going bananas, you know. And you listen to his part in full and you're like, oh my gosh, this guy is doing so much cool stuff. Yes. You know, it just, <laughs> and on his microphone stand, if you, I don't know if it, if he was doing that, I only saw him the one time and on his microphone stand, he had two sport drink bottles with long straws. <laughs> one was filled with brandy and the other one was filled with red wine. Wow. And he was just wow, sucking so he them was down. Just like, like, yeah, well, there's something about him that's like strangely chill, you know. Yeah, while the are crazy. There's yeah, something about him kind of like while he while he's doing all this madness with his claw grip. Oh yeah, you got Pete Townsend yeah. doing the windmills. You got Roger yeah. Daltrey swinging the mic. I mean, you know, it's like and, and the wildest the, drummer ever. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you had Keith Moon just being Keith Moon. Yeah, unfortunately, before he died, and it was like, damn. So you toured for how long with the band? Like in uh, a like, van, like you, yep. what you would think a stereotypical like bar band hopping from place to place to place. Yeah, we did that for six years, six and a half years, something, something around there. We um we didn't live anywhere. God. We didn't have apartments, didn't have houses. We we had allotted it where like because I told you we we're playing for like 20, 30 people a night. We allotted it where we each had to live off like 10 bucks a day. <laughs> because like you had to have some money aside if the car broke down or if this happened. Right. And, you know, and so that's pretty much what we did. And it was, so we were like broke, you know, we're barely, we're booking ourselves for a long period of it. And um, I mean, you know, we're only playing for like 20 people a night, but it was, it was one of the greatest experiences you could, you can imagine. I mean, I remember turning to the drummer at one point and I was like, Derek, man, if, if tomorrow we break up or if tomorrow we sold a million albums, like, I don't know if we're ever going to top this, this period of the road that we're had, we've just had, like, you know, you're in a different city every night and you're meeting people and you're making like the whole country seemed to get like smaller to us. Okay. Like, we, we must've circled the country. My gosh, six years. It must've been like something like 20 times. Yeah. yeah. So you're doing this like nomadic musician lifestyle and, you know, obviously you're in a lot of bars and a lot of crazy stuff happens in bars. Yes. You know, has any of those experiences or some of the characters that you met in these bars made it into your books? 100%. Um, Black Mad Wheel is about a band from Detroit in, nine, in like the late 50s. And their stories, for sure. Uh, Ghoul in the Cape, which was a limited edition book, um, for sure. Story. I mean, the someone said that that book is an ode to drinking um that <laughs> for sure that there are stories from the high strongs touring there um i mean you could even argue more than that though because i wrote uh i think it was eight or nine you know in the passenger seat of, of while we're touring you wrote eight or nine uh, novels like yeah, novels? Novels. yeah. So, so just like a pad of paper and a pen is that how you did it so i did four that way and then eventually I got a laptop. It was like, so like my brother gave it to me or something. And then the band guys got me this, like, it was like a wood board with a pillow on the bottom. So you put that <laughs> in your lap and then okay. you put the laptop on top. Derek would drive, Chad would be in the back reading. And I was writing, you know, you're like, you got four hours between here and there yeah. every day. And you're like, I could look out the window. I could read, I could sleep or I could say that this is the this is discipline. This is the moment where I ride every day, and and that's that's what I did for you know years. Wow. So, well, the the point of bringing that up though was, it stands to reason that I mean I was in that life during those nine novels or whatever. It stands to reason that the the band and the experiences are all over those books. Sure, sure. Now I always feel like somebody who is writing music you know, is, you know, you're telling a story in three minutes or four minutes or however long the story is. So you don't waste words. So I think that transfers over to authors. You know, if, if you're a good 
music writer, you know, you're writing great um, songs. I think you're going to be a good author, or at least you're not going to waste the words. Well, here's the thing. Are you, do you play golf? <laughs> Very poorly. <laughs> but you're, you know, and I know whatever sports references are goofy to, to most readers, but right. I, I'm a, wait, I don't really, I don't play golf, but I love watching it. I don't know who who the hell am I? Like who who likes watching it that doesn't play it? But I fall asleep, but that's okay. No, I love it. I just <laughs> something about it. It's the kind of game where you can have on while you're doing other things. Oh yeah, I, absolutely. I, you know. So I kind of equate my writing to that. I I have a like I can crush it the long ball. I have a super long drive, and so the novel to me is very natural. Is wordy. Is you can go on tangents. You could go 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 and just like let it all hang out and blah blah. The mid game, the novella. Now that's a special spot to me because you still have the room to get wild, but now there has to be, you got to get right to it quicker, right? Or or just more sensibly. And the short game is, has always been the one I've struggled with the most. And that's, I think it's because like I told you, there was a decade or something where any short idea I had, I went to a song Mm -hmm. and then, and then all of a sudden after 10 years of writing novels and novellas, I was like, hey, let's write short stories. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. This is this is a different animal, man. <laughs> yeah. This is like a sharpshooter. You get like three, four verses in your song or however many you want. But the short story is is a very special medium in terms of like the horror genre. And I think we all want to write Monkey's Paw. We all want to write, you know, like like the like uh, uh, the Raven. We all want like sure, that sure. singular uh story that like encapsulates us and there almost seems like something more honorable about that than even a novel like if you can pull that up if you can pull off like one of the great short stories in horror right it is for me i feel like i have like a i'm like 10 years behind on it or something i did win a stoker for a short story so maybe i'm being like and i'm not trying to be like false modest and all that crap it it just does feel the least natural to me of the of the varieties of writing, including yeah. song. My hat's off to any music. I mean, anyone who can write and, you know, be good at it. I, my hat's off. It, it's, yeah, it's no tough doubt. work, yep. but I think there's a special place for musicians who can write a song. And like I said, you're telling a story in three minutes. And mm-hmm. if you're, and you can't waste words, you have to get to the point, you know, and I don't know. I, I just think it's an amazing gift. It's a, it's a talent. That's incredible. Yep, I agree. So where were you and what were you doing when you discovered that, hey, I can be a writer for a living? This isn't a hobby anymore. This isn't, you know, like something I enjoyed. Uh, yeah, I enjoy doing it, but holy shit, I can buy like a nice house and like make a living off of this. Well, that stuff didn't come till after Bird Box. But in terms of, you know, like Bird Box coming out and the movie. Yeah. Being picked- and the book becoming a bestseller, all that, that did all that. That Bird changed box, everything all, for all you? that. Yeah. Okay. I, w- I bought my first house at age 44, you know, Bird, uh, first one, I bought my first car around then too. Like Bird Box changed everything for me in that way. But, and, 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 I, and I mean this sincerely, every element of what I'm about to say here, much like a long time before that, I had already sort of accepted that this was like a possibility where you know, our band's touring, we're playing for nobody. We're making albums regularly um, with, with these self-imposed deadlines. Not many people are hearing them. I'm writing novel after novel with this sense that these will one day be on the shelf. And so there was always this sense of like, this is going to work out in that other way, so long as you keep regularly doing it. Okay. And, and, and I don't mean to sound like, you know, the Celestine prophecy or, or, or the secret, you know, you manifest sure. her, but maybe that is something to do with it. I don't know. But, but it's more along the lines of, I just assumed, hey man, if you keep working on this, it might not lead you exactly where you fantasize about it leading you, but it has to lead you somewhere because of the amount of energy you're putting into it. And so, you know, one day, um, you know, Domino sort of fell in favor of Bird Box being picked up by Harper Collins. And then from there, Bird Box did the rest for me. Okay. So... All right, cool. Now, you know, I, I keep on talking about music, so forgive me if I'm too musicy about all this. <laughs> oh, I love it. I absolutely love it. But 
you know, looking at the chronology of selling songs, you know, it's like, okay, it was vinyl. Then CDs came out. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Then Apple came along and you could buy just like the, you know, iTunes, you pay 99 uh-huh. cents for a single disc or, you know, one song, then it became digital. Now it's subscription, you know, it's Spotify or Apple music or whatever. And the musicians kind of got left in the dust. I think, you know, unless you go out and tour, if you're, you're not going to make a ton of money off of, you know, a subscription service, unless I'm wrong about that, but I don't think I am. But can you see that happening to the book business? Wow. That's, I've never even considered that or been asked that. Um, I was thinking about that a couple of days ago. I'm like riding around in my car listening. And I forget who I was even listening to. And I'm like, yeah, I, my kids laugh at me because I have satellite radio. And they're like, dad, that's so old fashioned. I'm like, <laughs> really? That's old fashioned, Spotify, man. dad, come on. You know, and I'm just like, oh, no, but oh. that is interesting. Obviously, the inherent difference, obviously, is that a song is so brief, right? Right. So you have like a three minute experience versus like a book is nine hours or something and that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Or, but at the same time, the audiobook thing is growing like so rapidly that and, and so many people I know that's that's how they read is audiobooks. Oh yeah, that's a, I love audiobooks. Yeah. Yeah. So I I I I don't know. I'd have to think about that one more. My instinct says no that they're just such different mediums hmm. that it would be really hard for um, books to be. They're just not as quickly digestible, whereas I feel like the song can like in an hour, you've listened to 20 songs, you know? Right. But, you know, I'm my head goes to Kindle Unlimited. Yeah. yeah. Where it's a you know, you pay 10 or 15 bucks or whatever it is. And you could read as many books as you want, as long as they're in that. Um, right. And, then, and, and, then author, and right. as an author, you don't get paid that much from it. But then as an author, just like as a musician, you're like you're seduced by the um publicity side of it or the chance for someone hearing it or the chance for someone reading it you know when when bird box first came out um it was my first book and i you know before it was published i got this box of 60 hardcovers in the mail and i went to StokerCon, and nobody knew who i was i didn't even have a book out yet yeah and i'm sitting there at a table with this box of you know the stack of bird boxes like 20 dollars a hardcover and at some point i was like Nobody knows me. You know what? And I took the sign down and I put up free hardcovers <laughs> gone within like five minutes. <laughs> and sometimes I think <laughs> about like how that moment acted as seed work. Mm. But that was very, I don't want to say calculated, but it was a finite room. Everyone in the room were horror fans. So by giving out these copies of Bird Box, it, you, I, I was aware that they were going to um, fans of the genre. With music, it's not like that. You, okay. You're not at a convention and, and hey, everyone, here's my, so in other words, like here's my um, song for, to 60 people for free. That's not how, it's not the same thing. Sure. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure that it could ever fully go that way, but I do know what you mean. I absolutely, yeah. it's an, definitely an interesting idea. So spin a black yarn. Let's go back to the books. Yep. Why write the book? Oh man. So I've been um, a fan of like the novella, um, the collection of novellas, the anthology forever. The very first, the first two horror movies I saw were both anthology horror movies. Oh. The first one was um, Twilight Zone, the movie. Mm-hmm. And the second one was Creep Show. And so my, my introduction, my, and this one I was like 12, whatever, my introduction, my falling in love with the genre was five unrelated stories in like twice over with like a host or maybe the town linked them or in this twilight zone like the the the, you know nebulous twilight zone linked them so from the word go i've always i mean i remember i used to walk around summer camping like i'm gonna make like a like a twilight zone movie there'll be one story in the woods there'll be one story in the lake there'll be one story on the road as if these couldn't all be in one story right and but forever i've been and i have a book called goblin yeah i saw that that. that's yeah it's a collection as well this most of spin a black yarn takes place in in or around sam hatton michigan which is where the novel daphne takes place and a couple other like novels and sam hatton for me is a little less um what's the right word because goblin is is like a very colorful very particular um place just like a tim burton movie is a very tim burton movie, right right sam hatton's a little bit more like 
closer to like the towns that like I live near that I grew up in that, you know, the industrial sort of Midwest kind of thing. So it gives me a little more leeway to uh, write. I don't want to say a little more realistic story, but, but have more realistic uh, landmarks or touchstones where sure. goblin is just super far out. That makes sense to me. So, you know, there's what, five, six novellas in um, spin a black yarn. You ever have the thought of, making those like full length novels um or were they like full length novels at first and you decided uh, to make them novellas um, or the last one igorov was a full length that i recognized as like this works you know half as much works it could still be about half as much but i have a soft spot for igorov was intentionally it's the last one in the book for mm -hmm. listeners it was intentionally written as like a um, a translation from Russian to English. So what that means, though, is that there's some clunkiness to it. There's some philosophical, sudden philosophical diatribes for two, three pages. There's maybe scenes that don't even need to be there. And that's some of my favorite stuff is like the, the old Russian books when you read them and you're like, where is this full philosophical like jaunt coming from? So Igorov was very intentionally done that way. And I was afraid if I squashed it anymore, I would lose that element of it. Igorov was a novel, but I can't imagine Doug and Judy. Well, I guess I could see them being a whole novel. That, that's interesting. Yeah, like, I, I, I could I could totally that. see that work. Yeah, yeah. You, you just, you know, they begin at whatever their beginnings are, and then you just keep on doing things that make the reader just despise them even more. Oh, that's you know, good. Like, you're right. You know, yeah. They're not nice people. Yeah, you know, they're uh -huh. they're the kind of people that you're like, ooh, they're pretty icky. These people are yeah. not nice. You know, I, I I I strangely I have a soft spot for Judy though. I don't know why. I feel like she kind of knew right from wrong. Yeah, Doug's just gone. Yeah, he's he's way <laughs> out there. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so if I'm a rookie writer or maybe even a writer that's been around for a while and I want to write suspense. I want to write horror because you know, that's your wheelhouse. You know, what are some of the elements I should be hitting? What, what would you suggest I should do to kind of prepare myself or what should be in my stories to make them more entertaining? Well, one thing to, and to circle this all back to music for me is that in terms of suspense, in terms of let's call it dread, and let's take a book like Bird Box. So if you can equate the writing of a novel to like playing a synthesizer or a keyboard, right? And if you just hold down one note, one dark, right? And if your story can, the, the minute it either leaves that note or, or a second note is added that makes it like too bright or too like a major chord or whatever, then at that point, maybe go back, maybe go back. Like try to maintain just that singular dread undercurrent of dread throughout like you would like a piece of music like you would a song and you can sense these things you're like going you're going and you're like oh and then i got that weird like funny scene with the sister well then get rid of it get rid of it let's let's let or may or keep the sister but get rid of the funniness let's try to keep it in this groove this boom 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 like dark side of the moon seems to have like a beat oh. to the whole thing yeah and i try to equate that to the writing of the novel and in a way we're only talking about, you know, even a 300 page story, a novel in a, in its way is still a brief experience. And, it, and, and as hard as they are to write, they're a lot easier to read. And oh, yeah. so if you think yeah. about it with that in mind. And if you think about that reader in mind and maintaining that mood for them throughout, just in terms of horror or suspense, the longer you can maintain that mood, I, I think that the richer the book becomes and the more it gets under like people's skin. Another thing is, with horror is that I think it's tempting for a new horror author to like, be like, and then, and then, and then there was a face in the mirror, you know? And you're like, okay, wait, hold on, hold on. How about we just get rid of the, in the telegraphing it. He's, you know, he, he, he's walking down the hall, he looks in the bathroom and there's a face in the mirror and that it's not his own. And that just kind of just drop it in, drop the scares in. And I think that if you let them come organically and naturally, that it becomes way more powerful than spotlighting it, mm. that, that telegraphing it. And that took me like a while to realize. That took me like, if you go back and read the first two books I wrote, they're like, and then the door <laughs> rattled. And then, 
<laughs> it is tempting though. It is tempting to put that you in there. That's I actually sure. feel like and then is a good title for a horror novel. And Ooh, then. there you go. I, I think we're uh, brainstorming here. But <laughs> for again, like say a newer author, what are some of the rookie mistakes you see that could be avoided? And it doesn't have to be um suspense or horror, but just in I mean, the one that comes to mind immediately always for me is a sense that a sense that a new writer has that the book they're writing has to represent them in full. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to include every single one of your philosophies or every single one of your stances or every single one of your, um, you know, uh, what's the right word? Um, uh, plot ideas or character mm -hmm. ideas. It can, you could write one just banana bonkers thing, but I think that a lot of new writers get tripped up on that. Cause they're like, well, how can I have a character do this? That's not me. This, well, you know what? This book isn't, isn't me but once you write two books then all of a sudden the spotlight is diffused right it's dispersed right. over two then three four five so you can't uh, my advice is not to look at that first book as it has to be your your manifesto it has to be your 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 whatever just get the story within in and of itself done and now that is something you have done and that represents you but it doesn't have to be in full also, how you how you act with your wife represents you, how you act in the world, how you do your job and your second book represents you and your third book. I like to think in terms of an eventual body of work, because I think what that does is it liberates each individual work from having to represent you in full. And I have friends who, you know, like brilliant friends with brilliant book ideas who I see get stuck at that stage of, you know, oh, you know, uh, it's not it's not smart enough. You know, uh, my book needs to be smarter. My book needs to be funnier. My book mm -hmm. needs to be, you know, no, 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 no. You just need a book done, a rough draft, let's say, call it a rough right. draft done. And then we can examine it and make it better or whatever. And you know what? If it sucks, great. Now let's write the second one. And that first one will be legendary for having led to your second one. So for me, it's get rid of these like self-conscious sort of, um, speed bumps, mm -hmm. be as free as you can with the rough draft. Don't be afraid of it all making sense and the rough draft being great. Get it done. Cause what would you rather have 300 pages that you get to work on and make better or no pages at all? That's awesome. I, I love it. That that's really cool. Uh, just to spin back around because I, I jump around in my interviews. I'm sorry, but you write bird box. Now, you know, there's all kinds of fame and notoriety and stuff that you didn't have. I mean, you weren't a new writer when you wrote this, but now all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of in the spotlight. Did you feel a lot of pressure to write the second, the whatever after that? Or do you just no. keep, keep on chugging along? I mean, some pressure because just because a bunch of people read it and because the publishing house, you know, yeah. was excited about it. But no, it, and I think, again, this is one of the many advantages for, I didn't get a book deal until I was 39, um, or the book didn't come out, I think, until I was 39, I was like 37. Uh, the movie came out when I was like 44, 40, like, you know what I mean? Oh, so, okay, so, yeah. So to me, there was already, there were already decades of writing for no reason, uh, mm -hmm. being broke, slaying to nobody, writing novel after novel and just thinking. So there was already a sense of like, What's the right word? Um, life without those things. Okay. Life without the things that you're describing. Yeah. And so, it, it, like, so what's the worst case scenario here? I go back to the, like, what are some of the best years of my life? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Cause, you know, musicians, you know, it's like, okay, they hit it big with, you know, whatever album. They said that sophomore album, that's a toughie. There's a lot of expectations. You know, when Bird Box came out, I'd already written 15 novels or something. You yeah, know? See, that's... And there's that too. So if I ever get, and I haven't, but if I ever get like really freaked out, stuck, I have a crate right here that has 25 novels that haven't come out yet. All right, let's find the best. Let's pick the best one from here and Damn. that'll be your next book. And maybe we get through that moment if it comes. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you what, I think this is a good place for us to stop. What's in your future? What's next? So I'm rewriting a book called Incidents Around the House. Um, I filmed recently a documentary of the writing of a newer book. Mm. Um, I can't wait, cannot wait for that to come out. Cool. And um, 
and the band has an album May 5th and I just finished like a, a, a solo group of songs too that I don't know when that'll come out. So JD, I thought of you when, yeah, you know, this is a collection of uh, novellas. It was the house washer where <laughs> it literally cleans everything <laughs> yes, uh, in your house. And I'm like, okay, he's, this guy's got a robot snowblower, a robot, uh, robot pets. <laughs> this is the perfect thing for you. JD. If they had it, would you use it? Uh, as soon as I, I had an ARC of this book, as soon as I read that one, I shot an email to Josh asking him where I could get this. Done. I was like, this is the greatest idea ever. Where where do I buy one? Who do I need to get to install it? Um, yeah, I, I would. I would See, totally you're the that. reason there's going to be a robot uprising. You're you're empowering these things, encouraging them, giving them access to your home. <laughs> But but if, but they're going to clean the house, you know. <laughs> if, if they clean the house, like they're earning their keep anyway. You know? JD will be okay because like, he'll be JD flying around in his car. His house. <laughs> JD will be doing a circular pattern flying around in his car, so he's he's safe. No worries. <laughs> How about the rest of you guys? Yeah. Would you jump on right. board with the house washer? I confess, I would. I really hate cleaning my house. I think I would. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't want to clean my house. <laughs> no, who wants to clean their house? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I'd go for. I it. mean, I oh, don't God. anyway, but I don't have. You know, I have but one robot uh, to clean my house right now. But I would, yeah, I, I confess, I would totally go for this. So I gotta say, this is one of my favorite authors that I've interviewed. He is like the, he is the blue collar author, and I think that really yeah. um, describes him well. His work ethic is second to none, and he's just that kind of guy that you want to go and have a beer with. You know, he's he's he was a lot of fun to talk to. You know, he's from I think it was outside of Detroit, correct? He's, he's from, from Ferndale. I know that because uh, my husband is also from Ferndale. Is so. that pretty close to Detroit? <laughs> yeah, it's like it shares it shares the border with Detroit. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like that Midwest work ethic thing going on. You know, I love the Rust stories band. of him writing his books as he's touring with his band in the van. And, you know, he's there's hours and hours of just like mindless, you know, driving. And he was just crafting books as he was doing that. So I thought that was really cool. I just kept thinking about getting car sick. Yeah, I'd get <laughs> like, car sick like, too. I, I can't do like, that. I, I, wish I can't I could. read. I can't yeah. look at my phone. Yeah, I would love to be able to use that kind of time for, for writing. But the best I can do is dictating. Do you guys ever? Yeah, I was just going to I was going to ask you guys, have you ever done that like in a car, like somebody else is driving, hopefully, and you're um, dictating or writing? No. I would vomit. Yeah. I would vomit. I can't. I write in cars. No. Do you uh, write on planes? I cannot write in planes because I'm too like self-conscious of people around me. It's okay. an erotic thing. Yeah. I, I, this is going to sound really silly, but the last time when I actually had to write on a plane because I was behind on something, I, I bought the seat next to me too, just so I would have that, that bit of a cushion. <laughs> oh, wow. Because I, I, I didn't want, not I didn't want somebody looking. I am far too pretentious. I want that person seeing that I'm writing a book. But, <laughs> nope. uh, right? Nobody cares. I know. No one cares. I, I'm 100% aware from that, but I watch other people. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I'm yeah. a uh, I love writing on the it's, plane yeah, and the train. That's my favorite because I don't too. get cars or you know motion sick and no i i wish someone would ask me about my writing it's never happened <laughs> i get asked I, I especially if i'm in like in the airport uh, i don't get asked or anything like that but like i i was just at a starbucks earlier uh getting some stuff done and i someone stopped by and talked to me uh, now i also have a giant sticker on my ipad that says kevin tomlinson author you know <laughs> So I'm in. Is me. it Lies. neon, Kevin? Right. You know, That's like, a lie from So your inconspicuous of you. I, I've done on on planes. Ask and me about like my that. writing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Have I mentioned yet that I am an author? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'll write. I do. I do quite a bit of writing using my iPhone, like using my thumbs and writing on the iPhone. So you know, I'm not that worried about people over looking on my shoulder and seeing it per se. Even if they did, I don't care. I really don't care. There's no, there's no state secrets here. They, they're welcome to read the book. Yeah, it's, it's honestly, it's not that I care. It's just it's distracting. Like yeah, the look yeah, over. Like right. I, I don't yeah, care that right. they're reading it, but to see somebody staring at my laptop screen takes me out of whatever I'm, I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. Josh is, he, he said something really cool in, in this, and and this is mainly I think just because he, he's a musician. I don't know if anybody else would have even caught this, um, but like holding one note through the, the length of a novel, yeah. you know, like yes, that or like holding a particular chord, like a certain sound, um, that mm -hmm. that is so true. And and like in thinking back on it, like when I was doing the book doctor stuff, you. 
you know, like I, I can almost, I can, I can picture a book that I was reading, you know, and hitting like a change in chord, you know, like, uh, you know, like that, that note goes away for this particular chapter, like the chapter just doesn't belong there, but that's just such a unique way of looking at it. Um, and, and if you didn't write songs, I don't think like, you know, he would have even picked up on it, but like the two things are, are very in, intertwined. I think the two types of. You know, yeah. Creativity. I picked up on that too. I was like, that's really interesting. He said, you know, what's that ominous note. So I had like jaws or psycho in my head or whatever. And he's talking about getting rid of the major chords, like anything that feels like a casino slot machine, cut it out. I don't know. <laughs> but um, it was really interesting. And I've heard other people say that before. What is the beat of this novel? And I've uh, really been thinking about that since I listened to the interview, because I'm not sure that I quite get it, even though I have a music background. I did classical piano under duress for many, many years. Thanks, parents. But um <laughs> Yeah. What, what is the beat of the novel? Like, what does that mean? What do you guys think about that? I, I think every story has got a, a certain beat to it, um, a certain mm -hmm. rhythm and the, the cadence, you know, if you're writing thrillers, it picks up, it gets right. faster and gets faster yeah. and faster. Like, and you know, if you think about it in, in music terms, you know, if, if it slows down when, you know, during your climax, you know, that that little bit that's slowing down needs to come out. Like you can, you can feel that. Um, I think you pick up on this. If you watch thrillers, if you watch, you know, an hour and 40 minute long thriller movie, um, you're going to find that very, very subtly in the, the soundtrack is a, a note or, you know, a couple of notes, but there's always some type of, you know, instrument playing on in the, in the background. And it's not necessarily music. It, it's just like Josh said, it could be one note being held out, um, but it really does set that tone. And if it goes away, you know, that silence all, also sets, sets the tone. It all, it all plays hand in hand. I, I definitely feel that. I, I um, when I am, especially when I'm crafting a scene, like there's a, there's a, there's a rise and fall to sort of the cadence of it. Like the, you know, the, everything in the middle tends to be lengthier, right? Like longer sentences, longer words, you know, more syllables. And then the, the closer I get to one end or the other, like from the start and at the end, it tends to narrow. So if you were to like graph that, it would look like a vo vocal wave, I think, you know, where it's, like short on either end, like comes to a point, but in the middle it rises up. Very cool. Yeah, if you read the short story collection, that the the Russian novel that or novel novella that he's got at the end, um, definitely has that in there. Like there's a certain rhythm to right. that entire story, um, that you know just lends to it. It just it feels like it's written, you know, in a different era by a different person or whatever. But it, it definitely stands out, you know, for for those same reasons. You know what else I thought was really cool that he said. Now that we're uh, just on it, but um. When they were talking about how despicable his characters were, and he, I think it was Judy was one of her name, and he yes. said he had a soft spot for her. Yep. And I always feel like authors should have soft spots for their icky characters. So I'm just wondering, do you like your like diabolical characters? I like mine. I don't know. Is that weird? I, yeah. I like all my bad guys. I, I, I think I think you have to make them likable, right? You want because you want the reader to, to feel something for them other than, yeah. you know, hate and despise them. Um, the more likable you make them, I think the more confused the reader gets or the more into it because they they get thrown by their own emotional reaction to it. And, you know, that, yeah. that's even better. Well, I mean, like, look at Dexter. Jeez. Yes, he's a serial Dexter's killer. A good example. He is a cold blooded serial killer. And they make you feel bad for him. Correct. So one of the things that jumped out at me was this isn't typically, you know, Spin of Black Yarn wasn't the typical book that I would read. I, I don't read a bunch of like little stories in one book. And I really enjoyed this. Do you guys, have you written these or do you plan on doing anything like this? I, I personally haven't. Um, I understand why, why uh, I mean, if the story ends up at a certain length, I, I'll, I'll let it go. I, I think that's, you know, why these kind of stories exist. Like, I think you, you come up with the idea for the story and you have to tell the story, but you don't want it to be longer than it should be. You don't want it to be shorter than it should be. You have to just let it tell, you know, tell the story the way it is actually meant to be told. Um, if that means that it's a short story at 5,000 words or a novella at 40,000 words or a full length novel at a hundred thousand words. Um, so be it. I, I think you run into problems as an author when you try to take one of those things and turn it into one of the others. If you try to take a short story, expand it into a novella, um, you know, all that padding stands out, you know, again, back right. when I did the book doctor stuff, I could take a, a novel and I could tell you that this person turned it into a novel from something shorter. And, you know, this part doesn't feel like it belongs there. This part doesn't feel like you know, this whole storyline, this whole point of view can go. And, you know, when you ask those questions of the original author, they will tell you, yeah, I put that in there later to try and beef it up. Um, you know, Carrie by Stephen King is a very good example of that. It was extremely yeah. short at the beginning. The novel itself is still short, um, but, you know, he, he stuck in newspaper articles and things like that in order to, to get it 
to be just long enough to, to make it publishable as a novel. Um, I think if you are going to do it, that's probably the way to go. Just throw in something that is so, you know, uh, different, you know, not, not, don't just add another character. Don't expand on something, but do something different with it to pad it. Yeah. I will say that one of the, one of the best successful attempts I've seen at that would, was uh, with Orson Scott Card's uh, Ender's Game, uh, which started as a short story. And I think once you get to the short story, the portion of it that was included in the short story, there's definitely kind of a slight change. But he that was such a – it was just a scene for an overall story that he was fully developed with, with a whole range of characters. So it, it made for something quite different. Um, but I've definitely seen that before where – people will expand a short story and you definitely see the, the watermarks. Yeah. It was the same thing with wool, right? That started yeah. as a short story. Too. Right. Yeah. And uh, my, my novella example is always fight club, right? Cause yeah. it's about 45,000 words and lots of indie books fall in that category. So yeah, make the story how long it needs to be. Yeah. And Christine, you can't talk about fight club. Okay. You don't talk about fight club. That's the first rule of fight club. I will if I want. I'm not in Fight Club. So I'm but the first rule, first, rule. Right first rule of Fight Club is talk about it all the time. <laughs> so so you, right the first rule of Right Club. Right Club. Wow. Right club. Uh, Bare knuckle Right Club, yes. And with that, <laughs> oh my goodness. JD, who's up next week? <laughs> next week, we've got Sarah DeVello. She's a mystery writer and creator of the Mystery and Thriller Mavens podcast. Um, she's interviewed everybody from Glee Child to some of the biggest debuts coming out. Her latest book is called Broadway Butterfly. It just released at the beginning of the month. Sounds great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.